at the very top, there should be a button, and next to a button, it should say ISO. Do you guys see that? Okay. When you press that button, it then brings up a menu that says ISO, and it allows you to change the ISO. I want you guys to just sort of briefly go through and see what your highest ISO number is and what your lowest ISO number is. What are you guys seeing? You guys need some battery? Yeah. I got 100 to 25, 600. I got 20,000 to 320. Makes sense. Okay, so, so the ISO is going to vary tremendously depending on the piece of equipment that you have in your hands. Okay? Um, and that's going to vary model to model, and older cameras don't go as high as newer cameras. Pretty much every camera that you're going to pick up is going to have a low ISO range of like 100 or 200 being the lowest it goes. Okay. Now a good ballpark for ISO, here we'll move on to the next slide here. A good ballpark for ISO is going to be when we use it. So we have our low ISO numbers being 100 to 400, somewhere in that ballpark. And those are going to be good for a bright sunny day. Very, um, a, a great and tremendous amount of light that's going to allow us greater flexibility. Um, but as we go into lower light situations, like in here, what do you guys think a good ISO would be? What would a starting point want to be? Anybody play around with this type of lighting? Two or three hundred maybe? We'll go up a higher. Four hundred, five hundred? I'd thousand, say I would start thousand? personally at about eight hundred or twelve hundred. Yeah. Okay. And so the reason for that is by starting, by understanding the light that you're in and starting with an ISO that's going to give you um, repeatable results, and I, I would stress the repeatable results, because when we take the camera, we want to be able to do and perform and create imagery again and again and again in a way that we understand it and we know what we're doing. The downside about ISO, and you guys may have noticed this, as as we increase the ISO, we increase our visible noise, or visible graininess of, the, of an image. For wedding photography, it's more important to me to capture a grainy, sharp image than it is for me to capture a smooth, blurry image. Okay? So if, it if for me, if that requires me going up to 12,800, I'll go up to 12,800, because I want that crisp, sharp image and I don't want uh, blurriness. You hit the, uh, you touched it. I'm not used to that. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> That's okay, We're, we can move on. Um, you can actually, go, back. No, go back. Sorry, yep. There you go. Alright, so, so graininess does increase as we do that. Um, the graininess of the camera, newer cameras actually have really good, I mean and by really good, I mean my current DSLR at 6400 probably produces an image like this sample at 200. Okay, so we shouldn't always just scoff at high ISOs because sometimes that's just relative to the equipment that we're using. Okay, a lot of the newer technology, I think you guys have the, what is it, the 5D Mark III? 6D Mark II. 6D Mark II? Yep. That was at 25,000, and that's what looked good in here for ISO. 25,000 looks good in here? Yeah, all the other ones look very dark. Maybe guess, well, that's, that's going to depend on other things that we have going on. Yeah, this one goes We're going to get to that. Like 10,000 is not bad. Okay. So, all right, any questions on ISO? What does it stand for? Image sensitivity. No. It, mean, it means well, international something. Standards. There we go. That's, I was just testing to see if you guys were falling asleep yet. <laughs> international standard standardization organization. Uh -huh. 
All right. Next one on our triangle is going to be shutter speed. Oh, actually, let's go back to uh, ISO one more for one more thing. How many of you guys are good at math? Oh, not me. <laughs> okay. How, how many of you guys aren't good at math? How many of you guys can double 100? Oh, I can. How many of you guys can have 100? I can. So when we're talking about ISO, if we need to make one unit of change, so let's say it's too dark, but it's not so dark that our image is black, um, we can incrementally go up by one unit of change. By default, our cameras allow either half or third stop increments, but if we try to remember doubling or halving a number, that's one full increment, that's one stop of change. And so in photography, we refer to this as one stop. So going from ISO 100 and doubling it makes it more sensitive, okay? So let's say we're at ISO 800 and we need to have that to make it less sensitive. What's our number going to be? 400. Okay, it's pretty simple, right? Sort of. <clears throat> All right. With shutter speed, okay, shutter speed also is doubling or halving, but the con confusing part is it's by fractions. With still photography, our faster shutter speeds are a tinier fraction of a second. But the same thing, we double or have our, our shutter speed to gain one unit or one stop of change. So how many of you guys know how to double or have a fraction? What do we do? Charles is good at it. What's that? Seven. Do you know, do you, can you explain it? To double or? Double half or half a fraction. fraction, what do we do? Isn't that like divide? We divide. If, it, if you multiply a fraction, we just half. So let's say we have one one hundredth of a second, okay. and we want to double it. Do you know how we double that? You, the, it's going to be one and like 62 something or whatever. You're so close. The easy thing to remember is at <laughs> one one hundredth, to double it, to give it more time, one one hundredth, we're actually going to have the bottom number. So to make this half of the time, it's going to be one fiftieth. Okay? And to have that bottom, to give it less time, it's going to go to one two hundredth. Okay? This is less time, this is more time. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It's kind of, it seems weird, but that's how it works in fractions. The smaller the denominator, the more time. Exactly. Yes. Right. Yes. 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 You confused me only because you caught me off guard. So. <clears throat> he was forced to do math as a kid, so he's good at it. Uh -huh. <laughs> he was forced. <laughs> Bro, you have no idea. Oh, <laughs> so when we're taking still pictures, and we're going to try to take a composition, um, with still photography, we have this general rule to avoid getting blurry images, um, and that's when we're going to take and not go to a slower shutter speed than 1 60th of a second. Okay? But there's a, a better way of figuring that out, and that's when we take 1 over the focal length of our lens, because our lens can magnify um, <clears throat> our camera shape. And so if our shutter speed is going to be, if we're, if, if we're taking photos of wildlife and we have a telephoto lens on, we're zooming way in, and let's say we're using a 300 millimeter lens, what would one over our focal length be? One three hundred. One three hundredth of a second, right? So we would need to, to go greater than this general rule of one over 60. Otherwise, at one over 60, our telephoto shots are all going to be so blurry that you might not even be able to recognize what you were taking pictures of. Does that make sense? I think I'm getting, so. I'm getting a lot of glossy eyes. 
<laughs> it's a little complicated. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Is your intervals just 75th of a second? Because you went from 150 to 125 and then 1 to 200. That just I'm just making, making oh, that one okay. right now. Okay. Just trying to make it easy now. Yeah. And the, the weird thing about still photography is it starts off at one second, then it goes one, then half, yeah. then quarter, then eighth. Yep. Then it goes from an eighth to a fifteenth instead of a sixteenth. Mm -hmm. And then it goes to a, a thirtieth, um, <clears throat> a sixtieth, and then a hundred and twenty-fifth, then two hundred and fiftieth, and five hundredth. So it doesn't follow that exactly per se, oh, okay. but it does for the most part. <clears throat> so maybe I could try to make this easier, but I'll probably get it wrong. So can you help me? Yeah. Okay, so in general, shutter is like your eyeball, so like that. There's something like that in the camera, just like your eyeball. In photography, you hear a click sometimes. Am I correct? Oh, every picture. You hear picture. a click, every picture. So if you, here, let me have that for a second. Take it off video, right? Did you hear that click? Okay, wait. It's releasing the shutter. You're that actually thing. Hearing two things happening there. You're hearing. What's the, is the first one the shutter? The first one is the mirror, the mirror going up, and then the second one is the shutter. Okay. So in general, the second click. Can I? Is here. the shutter. Can I have that camera? Mm -hmm. I'll show you guys. This is. It's important to know the anatomy of your camera. You guys notice. SLR stands for single lens reflex. Reflex being that your image comes in through the lens bounces off this mirror and into the eyepiece. In video mode, that mirror has to pop up because if it doesn't, the mirror is gonna prevent your image from being recorded. So with still photography, a DSLR is preferred because it allows you to physically look through the lens, okay? Um, because our, our film or our image sensor is behind the lens. When we take a picture, that mirror has to pop up out of the way. So if you guys watch this, it pops up out of the way. And then behind that, after that pops up, the shutter opens and closes. You guys see that? And they have mirrorless cameras now, right? So yeah. they don't have a mirror. Which at most of the professional videographers that do weddings, they're all shooting with these mirrorless DSLRs. Yes. You have one? Uh, okay, so one other thing I want you to help oh, me explain. Right so, right if your shutter is like your eyeball and you hear it in the camera, right? Like that. Click, click, click. When we're talking about fractions, and correct me if I'm wrong, I'm going to try to figure this out in my head because I get confused with this stuff too. Um, the lower the fraction, is it the quicker the shutter? Yes. Faster the shutter? Yes. The, 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 the smaller the fraction, the faster the shutter. So if it's one one thousandth of a second, yeah. it's taking one one thousandth of a second to open and close. Okay. If, it's, if it's a half a second, it's going to take one full half second to open, wait, and then close. So what does one one thousandth of a second, which is fast, right? Would that mean fast shutter? Yeah, so fast blink? It's like the fastest. So let's say fast blink, like super fast, right? So what kind of image does that result in? A blurry image or an in-focus image? Sorry, well, you could touch well, assuming the mouse again. that we have the... Uh, you could touch the mouse again. Yeah, no, these are good examples. Oh, these really? Would be, okay. These would be faster shutter speeds. We've got maybe not so much on this one. Um, It'll, like another movement. One. Uh, landscapes could be long exposures. It's hard to say because we can put our camera on a tripod. I'm going to show you guys some examples. So here we've got all these flamingos, and they're all moving. You can see that the that wings one with the wings. Yep. It captures this movement. This one's blurry because we can see the shake in that branch. So that would be a slower shutter speed. Okay. It, it captures movement really well. Like if you're running, it's going to cap. It's going to see you more in focus running than it would be compared to like one sixtieth. Correct. So a fast shutter speed, one one thousandth of a second, a fast blink, captures more of the movement, so yes. the photo would be blurry? One one thousandth captures, freezes motion. So this oh, is like freezes one one motion. Okay. of a second. 
So here, these birds were all flying Three around. Raises motion. Okay. You can focus on your subject and freeze that where it is. Got it. Okay. okay. But if it's so, if oh, right there, one two hundred fiftieth and faster. Okay. But if it's like, is a shutter speed one fourth? That's a pretty big fraction. That's yeah. going to be a very long exposure, and that's going to allow you to do something oh. like this, where you blur out your water, where you blur out the stars, let the stars create trails at, at night. Slow blink. Okay, so this is how, I don't know if your brain works this way, guys, but I need to know fractions if I'm baking cookies, right? So for me, one quarter of a cup is probably the amount of butter that I'm gonna need for maybe like 12 cookies, right? So for me, I love to cook, I love to bake. The only way that I know fractions really in my life, the only way I can apply them to my life is with maybe tape measure, like measuring things. Like if I have to, like I know a ruler's 12 inches, that kind of thing. But I really know baking. So I really know what a quarter of a cup is. So I know that a quarter of a cup is definitely way bigger than one one thousandth of a cup, right? So for this, one one quarter of a second is almost more. We're getting more of the image. We're blinking a lot slower, so we're capturing more. Capturing quick, capturing more, because I'm blinking slower. That's how your lens works. So, it, so the one one quarter of a second shutter speed, slow blink, it captures more, so we're going to not freeze the motion. How would I put that? Capture more of the motion, slow. We're going to slow. blur our motion. Blur. Blur the motion because you're capturing more of the image. Thank you. Captures more motion. What'd you do? Let's put more motion instead of freeze motion. Freeze more motion. motion. Would be the fast right. Speed. So we're going to do more motion. More motion. Does that help you guys understand it a little bit better? I know it helps me. There's number one, and there's the second option. The first option is a smaller shutter speed. This would be smaller because it's less. Like here's the one one thousandth of a cup. Then this one is a huge one quarter of a cup. Slow blink, more motion. Small cup, fast blink, freezes the motion. Because you're getting less of the image here. This is more of the image. You're seeing more of what's going on. You're seeing less of what's going on. Does that kind of make, that, make that sense? That makes complete okay. sense. At least to me. Are you guys following? Yep. Yeah. Are you guys ready to take a nap? Nope. <laughs> Mm. I think for, for the purposes of my class, since we don't do photography, oh, by the way, we're going to be doing this a couple more times with Mr. Lovell and Ms. Kaiser's class because they actually do photography. No so we're going to be no. repeating this lesson again no, and again, so don't know. worry if it's confusing There's you now. Same as weird as it was last year. Like, but the only oh God, way that you guys are going to remember this in a practical years. way and be able to use it is if you apply it to your life, okay? So think about baking, think about um, <laughs> blinking, think about eyes, think about the lens as an eye, okay? Okay, sorry, I digress. All right, here we go. Yes. <clears throat> All right, so, <laughs> so to add on uh, to this, when we are trying to make our subject stop and be on a single frame, we have to use a fast enough shutter speed that it's not going to blur that. One sixtieth of a second, like what I was suggesting on that last slide, will cause, if somebody is walking at you at a regular, normal, average pace, their hands, just through swinging, will be moving fast enough that their hands would be blurred, but their torso would be frozen. Does that make sense? Can you picture that? Okay. Where if somebody were running at you, they, their entire body would be blurred at 1 60th of a second. And that's why if we're taking a single frame, we're going to go to try to get our, our shutter speed at 1, 1 250th of a second or faster. With still photography, 
we can allow a lot of time per frame. So here we could do a single composition that is in the, in the realm of two to three or even eight hour duration at night. So instead of watching things move through the sky, we get this blurriness where the uh, observatory here, the telescope was actually turning, and then we get the, um, the stars turning or moving through the sky as the Earth rotates. So we can get these really cool, interesting night, night photos because of that. Same thing, if we calculate our exposure correctly, we could sit our subject on a chair in the water and let the waves at the ocean kind of blur out over time. So here, again, we're taking a long exposure, maybe 30 seconds, maybe a minute long. So every one of those waves that comes in creates this blurry effect. If your subject can be stationary during that time, you can get these very interesting and surreal type images. Does this make sense? Yes. yes. As a rule of thumb, you guys can all picture those waterfall photos where the waterfall is like soft and satiny. So to, to capture those images, we would have to do one tenth of a second or longer. One tenth of a second being the, the fastest we can go before it starts freezing and not looking as satiny. We want enough time to elapse during our exposure that each water droplet can make it from the top of the waterfall to the bottom of the waterfall in order to get that to look like this on a waterfall. Does that make sense? Kind of? Mm -hmm. Alright, how are you guys feeling? Good. I want you to Great. pick up those cameras again and I want you to find on the camera where the shutter is. Is yours dead? Is. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. You can just leave it there. Awesome. Kind of... Yeah, we're trying to leave the shutter speed. Okay, shutter oh, speed right. is going to be. Let's hit the turn the screen on on the back so that you can oh, see okay. the info so screen. Tap the shutter. Yeah, should be the shutter mark. Okay. 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 And then. Yes. 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 Oh, you're on video. No, what do you want us on? You want AV priority? Um, yeah, AV. That's yeah, any of them's fine. Actually, let's put it on manual for right now. Okay. Okay, AV's the aperture. Yeah, and then, can we take it out of live view? Hit that button. Yeah, when you want to show Okay, just so that we can see the information. Okay, so shutter speed shows up as what? A fraction, right? Really distorted picture. And so how do we change it? It's not a touch screen. On most cameras, it's not a touch screen. No, I tried, and it wasn't a touch screen. So, so mine would be 1 over 5 right now? 1 over 5 a second, yeah. Okay. And if we just roll the wheel, where's the wheel? Oh, right here. This wheel here. There you go. Okay, if you just roll the wheel, that's going to change our shutter speed. I want you guys to take a quick note of what the fastest shutter speed is and what the longest shutter speed is. 1 four thousandth of a second? And then what's and the T6I? Yeah. What's the longest what's shutter the speed? The longest wow. that you could get. The the low the mm -hmm. lowest fraction. It's gonna go beyond fractions. I have sixty to four thousand. I have four go back one. Thirty what? What do you think that is? Thirty is the of one thirty percent. If it were if it were a fraction, it would be show up as a fraction. Wait, wait, it's like not it's not a fraction, it's like point. So this is gonna be thirty units of what? What are we talking about? Of a whole of time. Time. So what time unit are we using? Second. Seconds. So that's gonna be thirty seconds. So your camera until it goes to bulb can actually do up to thirty second duration of time in one frame. What that looks like. It could look like this. It depends on what you what it is that you're doing with the camera. Oh. I mean, this you're not going to get star trails at 30 seconds. I mean, because if you just remember those, the Earth has to move a, a certain amount in order to see those trails. Um, and there's some math that you can do based on the focal length of your lens to to figure out how you can get the most star trails out of your image. So the lowest I could go, it says bulb, B-U-L-D. What's the, the last number before that? 30... 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Yeah. 
Some, so what does that mean again? So that means that the amount of time between the shutter opening and the shutter closing is physically 30 seconds. Okay. So if you take a 30 second exposure, you have to sit there and wait without touching the camera. So if you're gonna take a picture at 30 seconds, yeah. you need to have your camera on a tripod. Got it. Because that's a very long exposure. Yeah, there's okay. no way you can hold your camera still for 30 seconds. And by still, I mean, you could not have a pulse, you could not breathe, you could not do anything for 30 seconds. So the fastest the shutter can can go on this camera, I'm working on a T2i, the fastest the shutter can move is one four thousandth of a second. Which is pretty good. And the lowest it can move is 30 seconds. Yeah, and then that bulb, everybody saw bulb? So bulb yeah. refers to, um, historically, cameras used to not even have any kind of timing mechanism in them. And so you had a, literally an air bulb that you squeezed, and when you squeezed it fully, the shutter would open. When you released that bulb, the shutter would close. And so bulb is still a setting so that, can you take an eight hour long exposure with your camera? Can you? An eight we hour long what? Exposure. So, so shutter opens, shutter closes, eight oh, hours long. We can, if we can hold that shutter open, bulb allows us to do times that are greater than the 30 seconds of your camera. Okay. So this is like, could you imagine one frame every eight hours? That would be time lapse as far as video is concerned. Mm -hmm. Wow. I can show you guys exposures that have taken three or five years in duration from start to finish. Okay, after. So um, still photography, thinks of time differently. You guys are thinking generally in frame rate, how many frames per second you can fit in there. Um, and so that's going to be at, as close to shutter speed as still photography allows, as, as far as my knowledge goes. But aperture. Aperture is the next piece on our list. Okay? Aperture gives us a very small aperture with a very high number, which is kind of hard to get used to at first. And a very low number. So for instance, f1.8, our f-stop is what we refer to as our aperture. So our f-stop here is 1.8, and that's a very wide, bright aperture. This is the equivalent of turning, If we, let's, let's say we use a hose, okay? If I were to take a hose and set it to aperture 1.8, I would be letting a lot of water out of that hose. Can you imagine this? So this is opening that hose up all the way to let as much water out as possible. At, say, f8, we're restricting it quite a bit. So it's letting less water out. And then at f22, it's basically a couple drops per second. Okay, it's not letting much, much light out or much water out in this instance. The result is that our lower aperture number, even though it lets a lot of light in, it also reduces the depth of field significantly. Okay? So if we were to use these as a relative ballpark, our low f-stop gives us a small or shallow depth of field. Where a big f-stop, like f22, lets a lot less light in, but it gives us a more, a, a much deeper depth of field. Does that make sense? So these numbers are more relative to the depth of field than they are to the amount of light. Does that make sense? Kind of sort of. So. The, uh, so when a lot of water is coming out of the hose or a lot of light is coming into the lens, so to speak, then we see things more clear um, in the foreground of the image. When there's less light coming into the lens, we see the background in focus. 
So shallow depth of field is like a shallow swimming pool, okay? You see a little bit closer, right? So think of shallow, depth, shallow swimming pool. You see that much. But when you're in a deep swimming pool, deep depth of field, you're in the deep end of the pool, you see a lot more. So think of little, a little in focus, right? A little closer in, fo in focus. So little focus. This is very simple. It gets more complicated. But little focus and the deep depth of field, like the deep end of the pool, is more. Does that make sense? More of the image in focus. It's kind so, of a cool way to think about it because if we're in the 1.8 foot depth yep. of the pool, right? Only a small amount, if we were taking that as a picture, only what's in the water would be in focus. Where if we're in the 22 feet deep end of the pool, everything in the water is, is in, in focus. focus. And we would fully be in focus if we were standing there. Right. So when I say more of the image in focus, that means when you have a deep depth of field, when you're in the deep end, the background of your image is also in focus, the same as the person standing in front of your lens is in focus. So the background's in focus, the person's in focus. When you have a shallow depth of field, only the person is in focus and the background is blurry. And I'm only going to confuse you guys more with my next slide. So there are three variables that determine the depth of field. Okay? There, and these three are very important because first we have our, our physical aperture. Whether it's a small aperture or big aperture, that's going to help in terms of determining what that, that lens can do. But the next most important thing is the, the focal length of the lens. Because if we have a wide angle lens, almost everything is going to be a very deep depth of field anyway because of the nature of that lens. If we go to a telephoto lens, we could be at f22 or f35 and still have a shallow depth of field. And this is going to be... So I have a question. Yeah. So in general, because this is one of the questions on the year two list, the longer the lens, what does that mean if you have a very long lens? What does that mean? It's a telephoto lens. Yeah. Yeah. Is that what you mean? Well, we have like 18 millimeter lens that are like this, right? 18 yeah. to 50. Then we have really long ones that are like 18 to 250. And the depth of field, even on your 18 to 50, 18 to 55 millimeter lens, is going to vary between at 18, when you're zoomed all the way out to when you're zoomed all the way in. The depth of field shrinks at 55 millimeters versus at 18 millimeters where it's much wider. So if you're trying to get a shallow depth of field with an 18 to 55 millimeter lens, you have to zoom in so that you can shrink that depth of field. Okay. So there's really no hard, steadfast rule to the size of the lenses? No. It depends on how much millimeter they are? Yeah. The, the higher the, the focal length, so that look, when we get to the long end of things, yeah. that helps. And then um, generally fixed focal length lenses, lenses that don't zoom, are going to give us a shallower depth of field because they go to a lower aperture number. Got it. And then the third element that creates our depth of field is going to be the distance from the camera to the subject. The closer you get to your subject, the shallower the depth of field. The farther you get from your subject, the deeper the depth of field. So basically, the farther you get away from them, the more background you see. The closer you get to them, the less background you see. Yeah. And so here, we're so close to these leaks that even if I were at f22, that background would still be blurred. However, we'd see more leaves in focus. We'd see more um, of the mid-ground in focus. Does that make sense? So when we're using a DSLR, if we're taking, using it for still photography, we have all three of these elements within the viewfinder. So if we're looking through that viewfinder, we don't have to pull the camera away from our face to change those settings. 
I don't know how. Too complicated for right now. Okay. When so we, when we, um, you're coming with, a, yeah, I want to stop at depth of field. When you meet with, I think you're coming to the Ms. Kaiser presentation too. We, we chatted, I, I chatted with uh, Ms. Kaiser okay. shortly after we chatted this morning. Okay. She says that she came in and said, when you meet with me, your kids are going to think that you're wasting their time because they're already going to know this stuff. No, this stuff is complicated. So what we're going to do is, I think Mr. Lovell is going to come to Ms. Kaiser's class in two weeks, and she's going to do a very, very basic review of depth of field, aperture, ISO, and shutter speed with her class. We're going to sit with them, and we're going to review it again and again and again and again until it starts making sense. So we're going to stop here because we're going to get more of it with you and Mr. Uh, sorry, with you and Ms. Kaiser in a couple weeks. All right, sounds good. Okay, thank you for paying attention. I know this was a little technical, but again, we're going to get a lot more practice on it. Okay. I know she has a kid with Mr. Solo. Wait, what? Ms. Kaiser has a kid. Thanks. Seriously? You also have to fill out another sheet. Yes, you can. No. Yes, you can. He's okay, just, he went to size 14 too. <laughs> 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 but I mean, that's what his dad, so I mean. Yeah. Um, so he came there. Give all the DSLR cameras, please, to Gavin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Once you are, the shower or the depth of field. Um, yes. um, <laughs> okay, <laughs> right here. Like you want to write more on it? Yeah, well. Okay, please. try to fill these that's out to as best about, as maybe. possible, guys. I mean, divorce. Yeah. <laughs> So that's okay. pretty hard for that. He came there to do it if you want to use it. And, 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 and he oh, said it was okay to have a play in the game. And she said it was so not okay. Still so they were, they were, they were like calling, they were calling, they were like talking about who should we get the white one.